Let us go. It is time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Today is October 22nd. It is a very nice day. October 22nd is the feast day of one of my favorite saints. Saint? John Paul. Pope John Paul II. One of the greatest saints that we've had uh, off late. And, uh, and one of the several saints in my own lifetime that I have had uh, very close encounters with. So John Paul II is definitely uh, special uh, to me personally and uh, to our family in uh, many more ways than one. In 1981, when I was a, um, an apprentice journalist in a newspaper in Manila, I covered the visit of John Paul II. And then there I had a good fortune of being uh, up close and quite personal with, uh, with the Pope in an encounter I had with him at the Manila Cathedral. And, uh, well, you got a picture to prove it. There. Now, look at that. I challenge you to spot me if you can see me, see me where I, where I was in that crowd. That is, of course, the Pope, right? That is the Pope. Okay, so I'll give you three seconds to identify me. One, two, three, up. Oh, your time's up. <laughs> okay, there I am. There I am in that picture. Okay, this was this was taken by uh, the New York Times uh, photographer who witnessed the uh, the event at the cathedral, where after I had a chance to uh, hug the Pope, <laughs> uh, the burly Swiss guard, this guy, this guy, elbowed me. And I, uh, you know, found myself at the bottom of the staircase of the Manila Cathedral. Um, well, in the first place, it was his mistake, you know, because he allowed the Pope to walk freely uh, without anybody around him. And I uh, took my opportunity to uh, get close to the Pope. And of course, uh, perhaps that scared him. And that scared the rest of all of those other officials around him. And uh, I got an elbowing on the chest. But anyway... Um, it was all worth it because I that I had my chance to uh, be that close to the Pope that day. So today we commemorate uh, and give thanks for this great Pope, this great saint that the Church has been gifted with, in the person of uh, then Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, who then became. Um, Pope John Paul II, the first non-Italian Pope in uh, over 400 years of the church history. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a very, very special uh, Pope, and you can read all about uh, his life. I have three biographies of the Pope uh, in my own bookshelf. That is how much I have uh, uh, savored the life and teachings of this Pope, and I've got plenty of books on the threshold of hope to uh, threshold of hope to many other books that the Pope has written. And of course, one of his biggest uh, legacies is um, the uh, theology of the body, the theology of the body. So uh, something that we have also been commenting on time and again. Uh, we're going to delve deeper into the theology of the body as you grow older. Okay. So let us ask for the intercession of John Paul II, especially today, especially in this week, especially in these times when the church is again uh, uh, undergoing a lot of crisis, sadly, crisis coming from within. Um, there are plenty of uh, issues um, that are brewing these days within the church, especially with the synod going on, the synod on the uh, Pan-Amazonian uh, evangelization and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So let us pray for all the cardinals and bishops and representatives of the church in Rome who are there with the Pope currently talking about the Amazon. We need to pray. 
And let's ask John Paul II to intercede uh, on our behalf to uh, help um, those people with uh, the issues that they're facing in the church. Okay, but then let's continue with the meditations of the Mysteries of the Rosary. Uh, today's Tuesday, so we're supposed to be meditating on the Sorrowful Mysteries, right? But since we're already almost, uh, you know, done with the Sorrowful Mysteries and we're nearing the end of October, I will accelerate the uh, commentary on the other uh, mysteries we haven't yet touched on. Okay, so that we finish October with at least being able to... Uh, to uh, understand all the mysteries of the rosary. So I want to deal with the second joyful, no, wait a minute. Now the third joyful mystery, we had a second joyful mystery yesterday, so we'll just continue. Today we'll do the third joyful mystery, which is the? Nativity. The Nativity of our Lord. Okay. Nativity of our Lord, of course. Of course, this particular mystery is very familiar to everybody because we celebrate this mystery big time. Right? Christmas. On Christmas. Christmas Day, December 25th. But you see, every day can be Christmas for us. Every week can be Christmas for us if we meditate on the third joyful mystery very often. Okay? And we all know the story. We all know the story. There was a census uh, ordered by uh, Caesar Augustus and uh, everybody had to go home to uh, the place of his ancestors in order to register. This was the first, among the first census done, um, the attempt at least, uh, of the Romans to uh, do a census of uh, people all over the world, or at least their empire. And so Joseph was from the line of David, the line of David coming from which town? Bethlehem. From Bethlehem, uh -huh. right? Yep. So they traveled to Bethlehem in order to register uh, for Joseph's, uh, you know, because they had to go to where the head of the family uh, originated from. So they went to Bethlehem. At that time, our lady was already fully pregnant with Jesus. So uh, there was a big chance that uh, she would deliver there instead of, uh, you know, in Nazareth. But that all happened in order to fulfill the prophecy. Right? That he's the son of David, so therefore he had to be born in the town of David. Okay? So this is Bethlehem. So our Lord, our Lady, our Lady uh, and Joseph traveled. Um, and when they got there, well, it was a time for our Lady to deliver. And the sad part was that there was no room in the inn. Very good, Chevelle. No room in an inn, no home could take them in, no accommodations, because, well, I guess, since everybody was in his hometown, they ran out of places to accommodate people. So that was a tough challenge for Our Lady, an even tougher challenge for St. Joseph. You can just imagine St. Joseph must have been so heartbroken that he could not even provide a good place for his wife and his firstborn son to have a place where he could be born. You know, as a father, I can tell you that if there's anything that fathers want to give their wives and their children, it is a good place where they could be born. A good, comfortable place where their wives could at least have the consolation and comfort of a good place where he or she, I mean she, <laughs> she could give birth to a child. So I could imagine the agony, the agony of St. Joseph. I could imagine the stress on St. Joseph for not being able to find a good place for Our Lady to uh, give birth. So that's one of the challenges of St. Joseph. Okay? One of the challenges of St. Joseph. So anyway, uh, for our benefit, our Lord, who, from, who has always chosen poverty as a way of life, wanted to begin his journey on earth, precisely marked 
with poverty. And that is why he, the king of kings, the creator of the whole world, the one who made everything, chose to be born with nothing. Chose to be born in the most nondescript place on earth. In a cave. In a place for animals. Not even a place fit for people. That was the kind of poverty our Lord is teaching us in Bethlehem. That is the kind of detachment that our Lord wanted us to emulate. Wanted us to understand that there's nothing in this world, no material goods in this world can ever satisfy us. And our Lord himself wanted to show us that example. He could have had everything and anything he wanted. Yet, he chose to be poor from the very beginning. He chose to be deprived from the very beginning. He chose to suffer all that cold. As a child, he was already suffering. His whole life was a crucifixion. Right? His whole life was marked by the cross from the very beginning, from his birth. So poverty, detachment, sacrifice, these are the trademarks of our Lord's life. And it began there at his birth. At his birth. And look at, look at who was favored to be the first visitors, the first people to, to, to learn about the birth of our Lord. It was the poor shepherds. Poor, poor people. Right? Poor people. Our Lord loved the poor. Our Lord loved those who are detached from material goods and material wealth and, and prosperity. But he did not deny. He does not deny rich people. He does not deny wealthy people. In fact, he invited them too. And who are the wealthy and wise men who came to him? The, the three kings. Right, the three kings. So that 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 uh, that whole Christmas event, that whole first Christmas, the birth of our Lord, shows us already, in real dramatic fashion, what our Lord came for, and who He came for. Right? He came with nothing. He came as a poor uh, 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 a baby, and He attracted. In all that poverty, in all that deprivation, in all that selfless service, he attracts everybody from the poor, those who have no means, the simple to the sophisticated, the wise men, the kings of the earth. Right? And that is why the church is universal. That is why Jesus Christ is universal. That's why Jesus Christ is for everybody. He does not choose who you are and what you are in life. He wants to call everybody. He issued an invitation to everybody. He sent the angels to the shepherds and he used uh, the stars, his own creation, to attract the, the, the curiosity of these wise men from the east. And they traveled all that distance to meet the king of the universe. The creator of that star that they so admired that it was so attractive to them. And they found meaning behind that star. They found a calling. They found a vocation behind that bright star that attracted them to Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful messages that we could, uh, of course, continue to, uh, to uh, understand from this message of the birth of our Lord, the third joyful mystery of the Holy Rosary. And for us, what can be our resolutions? What resolutions do you think can we draw from the meditation of the third mystery, joyful mystery? Anybody? <coughs> What's that, Joseph? Detachment. Let us imitate our Lord's example of detachment. From material goods okay so poverty 
detachment, very good virtues to to uh, emulate from our Lord here. What else? What else? Chevelle? Anybody? Docility. Yes, Joseph, of course. Docility, right? Our Lord submitting himself. Okay? Obeying, submitting himself to, well, this is what the Father had intended for me. He didn't want a palace where I should be born. He wanted me to be born in poverty, in a cave, with animals. Yeah, he submitted himself to the will of his Father. And he also just submitted himself to the care of St. Joseph and Our Lady. See? So he allowed himself to be dealt with in the manner that St. Joseph saw fit. Okay? Which was, well, this is all I could give you. Okay? And so he allowed St. Joseph to handle his own affairs. You see how our Lord, eh? subitus erat subitus ilis, from the very beginning, he submitted himself to them. He was obedient to them, to his own creatures. Okay? So what else? What else? So these are okay, very beautiful thoughts that we could, we could have while uh, we meditate on the third mystery, the joyful mystery of the rosary, the birth of our Lord. Okay, folks, that's it for us. It's time. Yes. What else? Chevelle. Huh? Oh, mortification. Yeah. Okay. Chevelle wants to add into those considerations the mortification, <laughs> spirit of mortification, which our Lord also showed us there. Of course, he sacrificed the cold, right? With, with, he didn't have a soft bed to, to, uh, to lay his uh, back on, right? He was on hay. Imagine how uncomfortable that could have been, right? And then, uh, you know, so it was cold and snowy maybe, you know. So our Lord, yeah, suffered and he offered it up, okay, for us. Okay, what else? Any more you can add? Okay, I guess that's it. We'll have a, you know, we're late for Mass. Okay, anyway, bye-bye everybody. We'll bye. see you tomorrow.